Now we're going to go into a different direction for the course and we're going to start getting a little bit more mathematical by taking a look at the topic of measurements. And it is very difficult to overemphasize how important this topic is because you'll be taking measurements a lot during the course, whether you're doing them in person or watching them on a video. And although I'm sure that many of you have taken measurements at some point using a ruler or some other device, the way that we do this in chemistry is very particular. And so you'll want to learn all the details as best as you can to maximize your success in this course. So much of our lab work requires obtaining measurements. Some of them are simple observations, but in many cases it's looking at uh, different kinds of scales to interpret numbers. And you will need to correctly interpret measurements both in the lab and in the lecture uh, on various assignments that you'll see. And as I mentioned, we have rather particular ways of doing this and uh, not just for chemistry but for science in general and you'll want to master these methods. So first, what are the types of measurements we might encounter? I could ask you the question, well, how far is it from Rio Hondo College to UCLA? And some people might say, well, it's 25 miles. And other people might say, well, it's 35 minutes if there's no traffic, but maybe over an hour if there's traffic. But you see, those are two totally different types of answers. One of them was in distance, and the other was in time. It's not possible to just say, oh, it's, um, it's 17, because no one would have any idea what you're talking about. So your answer to this question has to have two very important pieces of information within it. Your answer must have a numerical value, and it must also have a unit. So here are a couple examples, 25 miles, 45 minutes. So the kinds of things that we measure, we're going to start off by looking at measurements of length, and the reason for that is because they're probably the most familiar to you, the ones that are easiest to relate to. And so that's simply the distance from one location to another. It could be a very, very small distance, like, for example, the center of an atom uh, to uh, the distance of another atom uh, in a bond. And it could be very large, like the distance, say, from the Sun to Neptune. We like to measure mass a lot in chemistry, and that is a measure of the quantity of matter. And we're going to see later on that that's directly related to the number of atoms that a substance has in it. So the more matter an object contains, the greater its mass. Now let's take a little aside on that for a second and compare the differences between mass and weight. The word weight specifically tells us that we're looking for what is called a force. What it is measuring is the gravitational attraction between an object and the Earth in almost all cases unless you happen to be on the moon and then of course it would have to do with the attraction between the object and the moon or the object and Jupiter etc. Now weight is absolutely not the same thing as mass. So let's t say we have a one ton uh, rock on the surface of the earth. One ton is a weight measurement. 2,000 pounds, which is the same as one ton, is a weight measurement. How will its weight change if we move it to the moon? Well, the moon has less mass, and it turns out that's what affects the, uh, the weight. And so our rock would have a much lower weight on the moon. Compared to Jupiter, though, the rock would have a much greater weight because Jupiter is much more massive. There would be a stronger gravitational pull. But how will its mass change? Well, the mass would be the same because the rock would have the same amount of matter in it regardless of whether it's on Earth or on the Moon or on Jupiter. Now, what I need to tell you is the problem with this originates 
more in English than it does anything else. And that is because when we want you to get the mass of something, more often than not, we say, go weigh it. And so a lot of the times when people are asking you for a weight, they really want you to get a mass. And so it's going to turn out that because we're taking all of our measurements from the same point of reference on the Earth, it really doesn't matter which terminology we're going to use here. So our first important mathematical topic is on scientific notation, which should be a review based on things you've learned in earlier classes. So many of the measurements that we deal with in this class are extremely large, like the number of atoms in a drop of water, or extremely small, uh, like as I said, distances between atoms. So we use scientific notation in many cases uh, to simplify working with numbers of those magnitudes. And it's essentially to keep us from having to use too many zeros in the numbers that we write down. So let's quickly review how it works. Let's take a value under consideration and let's think about uh, how we're going to do this. So the first thing that we want to do is locate the decimal point. If the decimal point is not written in the number, then you can assume that it's right at the end of the number. And you want to move the decimal point uh, left or right, depending on which way it's going to have to go, until it's just to the right of the first number which is not zero. So for example, in 582, the first number that's not zero is of course five. The decimal's not written here, uh, but we know that that's where it would belong. So we're going to move the decimal from here to here, just like that. Now, what have you just done? Have you made this number larger or smaller? Well, whenever we move the decimal to the left, we make that number smaller. And specifically, we've made it a hundred times smaller. Every decimal place multiplies by 10. So if I'd move the decimal point from 2 to between 8 and 2, that makes the number 10 times smaller. And then from between the 8 and the 2 to the 5 and the 8, that's another 10 times. So 10 times 10, 100 times smaller. So we want to go ahead and look. And we said we went two places and we went to the left, two places to the left. So our new number is 10 to the 2, or 100 times smaller than it was to begin with. So we have to correct that. You can't just leave the number like this. That's a totally different number. So we correct it by multiplying it by 100, or 10 to the 2. So ultimately, if the decimal was moved to the left, the power is positive, so two places to the left, 10 to the 2. And if you had moved the decimal two places to the right, it would have been 10 to the negative 2. And so our number is 5.82 times 10 to the second. If that went too fast, go ahead, take a moment, and go back over this one more time. Watch the slide again. Review what's in the textbook. But in the meantime, I would like you to practice uh, writing these numbers in scientific notation. So please take a moment, pause the video, and when you're done, come back and we'll go over these values. Okay, let's go ahead and try to answer these questions here. So let's take a look at this first one. I've written the decimal place explicitly uh, in that last place. So where is it moved? It's, it's going to need to move between the 2 and the 8. So that's 1, 2, 3 decimal places to the left. So let's rewrite the number as 2.894. And that's going to be times 10 to the positive 3 because if you move the decimal to the left, that needs to be a 3. Every step made it 10 times smaller, so each one of these makes it 10 times larger to balance out. Okay, how about here? The decimal needs to go here. 
And to do that, you would have to go one, two, three places to the right. So this would be 4.289 times 10 to the, well, if it went three places to the right, it's going to do the opposite of what we did here, 10 to the minus 3. And then finally, the decimal here needs to go right there between that 2 and the 3, the non-zero digits. So we've got some counting to do. So this is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places to the right. So 2.32 times 10 to the minus 6. Now, just some notes. When should you use scientific notation? Well, first of all, always use scientific notation when you're told to do so. But I would recommend that you use scientific na notation uh, for numbers that are uh, greater than or equal to 10,000. And any numbers that are uh, less than, say, 0 0.001 and though that's a good rule of thumb because we don't want to be counting lots of zeros neither of these numbers uh, really needed scientific notation they were both fine this was just good for practice but this one where I had to start counting all those zeros th that starts to become a headache and so these are good guidelines here for me that's not going to be explicitly stated anywhere in a textbook or anything like that it's just my opinion now in the measurements that we take, there are digits which we are sure of and some which we are not sure of. And so it makes sense that we would call the digits that we are sure of certain. And the digits which we are not sure of, the ones that we have to estimate, are called uncertain. And those are also sometimes called estimated digits. So whenever you have to estimate, uh, that would be considered an uncertain digit. In other words, you're having to make an your best possible guess based on the evidence you're given. So the way we take a measurement is we first determine which digits we know without question, the ones which are certain and which do not involve an estimate. And then we estimate exactly one uncertain digit. There are some cases where you will only have one digit because you're not certain about any of the digits, but that's very rare. It's usually going to be the case that we have some certain digits and then exactly one uncertain digit. Now, uh, ultimately, when we go ahead here and we talk about the different values and their certainty or their uncertainty, uh, we're going to have to refer to the place value of numbers. It's much easier to do that than say, that number two to the right or that number three to the left or what have you so you really need to know these terms here and I'm sure you've learned them before but if you haven't used them in many many years you need to take the time to really learn these so you know the one here is the thousands place you need to make sure that all of these that end in uh, ands you know thousands or hundreds or tens um, are not confused with the ones that end in THS. So tens is different than tenths. And this is hundredths and thousandths. And it also is really important that you be able to answer, write these things down in uh, exponential notations and in fractions. So for example, tenths would be, as a fraction, one tenth. And ones would just be uh, one, of course, and tens are tens, and this is a hundred, etc. And it's also going to be important, as I mentioned, that you be able to write these in an exponential notation. So a hundred is ten to the two, and ten is ten to the one. By the way, I'm not talking about these numbers, 2, 3, 4. I'm talking about these numbers in red. 1 is 10 to the what? 10 to the 0. Okay. 1 tenth is 10 to the negative 1. 
and 100th is 10 to the negative 2, 1,000th is 10 to the negative 3, etc. Uh, let me just finish this off. So this would be not quite the right color, but close enough. Actually, I think those are the same. Here we go. One other thing you should know is that I am colorblind, and I will sometimes say things that might sound crazy, like look at the orange spot when there is no orange spot. So just try to make your best guess as to what color I am referring to if I do that, and I do apologize. All right, so make sure you know those if they're not familiar. So continuing on then with certain and uncertain digits. Let's say that you're looking at a ruler. And the ruler has tenths of a centimeter as its smallest marking. And that is going to be the case for most rulers that you will use. If tenths of a centimeter are the smallest marking, that means it's going to be easy to read anything in the tens and the ones and even the tenths place. But what you will be able to do is then estimate one decimal place to the right, as you'll see in just a moment, which would be the hundredths place. So your answer should, if the smallest marking is in the tenths, you'll want to go one decimal place to the right, the hundredths. Let's say that you're using a thermometer, and the smallest marking on the thermometer is whole degrees. Whole degrees means ones place. So what is to the right of the ones place? It's the tenths place. So whenever you use that thermometer, not just today, not just tomorrow, but forever and ever, you would always go to the tenths place with that thermometer. And you want to be very careful never to drop that estimated digit. So, for example, if we had agreed that we're going to go to the tenths place and you're right on the 15 mark, you wouldn't write 15, you'd write 15.0. You've already agreed what decimal place to go to. Let's take a look at a couple of thermometers that would show that difference here. Well, let's compare. So, these two thermometers are measuring the same temperature, but you'll notice that the thermometer on the left gives you a much finer reading. Uh, this is 31, this is 32. Let's see if we can blow this picture up just a bit. So we ask ourselves, what are the smallest markings or the smallest interval? Well, if that's 32 and that's 33 up there, this line here divides that in half. That would be 32.5. So what do each of these lines mean? Well, that's 32.1, 32.2, 32.3. What am I counting by? 32.1, 32.2, 32.3. I'm counting by tenths. Each one of those markings is a tenth. And so what that means here is when I look at this measurement, I can tell for sure that this is definitely between 32.3 and 32.4. That's certain. And so that's why I say this 3, this 2, and this 3 are certain. I then estimate one decimal place to the right of the tenths, the hundredths, and that would be a 3, and that would be the end of it. If I go ahead and look at the other thermometer, it doesn't give me quite as many decimal places here. Well, I can see that it's clearly, uh, well, if this is 30 and this is 40, then what are each of these markings? Well, that's 35, halfway in between 30 and 40. So that's 35. This would be 30, 31, 32, 33. I'm counting by ones. So with this thermometer, I could only go to the tenths. It seems pretty clear to me that this is between 32 and 33. And it's really hard to tell how, how close it is to one or the other. It looks like it's much closer to 32. So a reasonable guess here would be 32.3. Some people might say 32.2, and I really couldn't argue with them about that. So which digits are certain and which are uncertain? In this measurement, as we already said, this 3, this 2, and this 3 are certain, but the last digit is always the uncertain or estimated digit. So it's the 3 in the hundredths place. On the other hand, in this drawing, the hundreds and the one, excuse me, the tens and the ones are certain, the three and the two. 
but the last digit is the tense. It is uncertain. Whenever we read a value on an electronic device like we have here, there are still certain and uncertain digits. And uh, when we look at that, the uncertain digit is still the last decimal place. The only thing is that the electronics inside are taking care of that for you. So the 6, the 8, the 6, and the 0 are all certain. That 5 is uncertain. It might really be a 3. It might really be a 4. It usually is going to be plus or minus 1 or 2 of those numbers. And that would be written on the machine itself. Okay. What about here? Well, here we have what's called a graduated cylinder. When we say graduated, uh, we simply mean that there are markings, like on a ruler. Those are gradations, OK? Or graduations, however we want to refer to that. And you'll notice with, with uh, water, or anything made of water, this is just water with uh, uh, blue food coloring in it, that at the surface it makes a curve. We call that curve a meniscus. And so if we're going to go ahead and look at this, the rule is going to be, uh, the technical rule is you always read in the middle, which means that it's the bottom of the meniscus, because the meniscus will always go down for water. So all of the measurements you're going to be taking, uh, it's going to be the bottom of the meniscus. However, going back just a moment, with mercury being the only exception, mercury, the meniscus goes up. So you would actually, as I said, you read in the middle. So you would technically read at the top of the meniscus for mercury. Mercury is very toxic. It's very unlikely uh, that you will encounter mercury, except maybe in taking uh, blood pressure readings using very old devices. So it's almost always going to be the case that we can just say read at the bottom of the meniscus. And certainly for this class, it will always be read at the bottom of the meniscus. So let's see if we can get a closer picture of that. So what are our numbers here? We've got 60. That's this number here. 70 is that one right there. So 65. So these are 60, 61, 62. These are ones. So you go to the tenths place, one decimal place to the right. So let's try that. So this is 65, 66, 67, 68. And 69 is right there. That's a little hard to see. Uh, now, it should be clear to you that the bottom of the meniscus is between 68 and 69. So the 6 and the 8 are certain. 68 point, now here we're going to estimate, looks to me like it's closer to the 68 than the 69. So I'm going to say 68.3. And that would be uh, my measurement. Uh, the numbers for the measurement. Again, I had to estimate here. I'm not positive about that. And if someone said 68.2, that would be perfectly reasonable. I would definitely argue 68.9 would not be correct, or 68.8. But 68.3 seems the most miser uh, the uh, the most reasonable value to me. So let's practice. Here are three ruler diagrams. And I would like you to uh, look at each of these and come up with a measurement uh, for what they stand for. So there's a red line and there's a blue line. And so you'll give me a red line measurement and a blue line measurement. Uh, they're not to any kind of scale. Clearly, this wouldn't really be one foot when that's one centimeter. But using these units, that's what I want you to come up with. And I want you to also notice that even though these are both centimeter rulers, the smallest markings are totally different in here. And so that means there's going to be a difference in how we report these. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, blow these up for a second. And if you want to pause each time I do that and write down a measurement, you're welcome to do that. So that is the first set, if you want to pause. And let me see if I can get both of these in the same picture. And those are the bottom two, if you want to pause and finish. 
Okay, I'm assuming that you've paused and written down six measurements at this point. If not, please do pause. Okay, so I don't even look at these lines yet. That's the key. Don't look at the lines uh, and measure them until you've already established the decimal place. So what do each of those smallest lengths mean? Well, if this is a 1, this is a 2, then clearly this would have to be 1.5. Couldn't be 15, because 15 is not between 1 and 2. So if this is 1 and this is 2, that's 1.5. So this is 1, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. 1 .1. I'm counting by tenths. So whenever I use this ruler, always and forever, if the smallest markings are tenths, I will always go to the hundredths. Correct? Okay. So let's take a look here at this first one. So that looks like it's uh, almost certainly between uh, 4.2 and 4.3. And then how far along is it? That's again subjective. Looks like it's about halfway. So 4.25 would be a good value and then the units are centimeters. Now this one looks like it's right on the line to me and let's assume it is. If that is the scenario that's where you have to be most careful. We've already agreed that we have to go to the hundredths place. So you can't write 3 and you can't write 3.0 it has to be 3.00 centimeters. If you thought it was just a bit short, 2.99 would have been fine as well. But ultimately, it needs to be extremely close to 3.00 and go to the hundredths place. Now, these are arguably the same lines in these two figures. However, I don't have much to go on, and I can't just draw little lines in here. Um, you have to use the device you're given. So the only thing I'm certain of with the red line is that it's between 4 and 5. That's the ones place, four, five, six. So that means I'm going to have to go to the tenths place. So if I look at this, I'd say it looks like it's a little closer to 0.3 than 0.2, but that's really very subjective. So I'm going to say it's 4.3 centimeters, and I'm sure some people said it was 4.2 centimeters, and either of those would be acceptable answers. The decimal point is the most important thing, uh, with the decimal place rather. How about here? If this is right on the line, this one can't be 3.00 because our smallest markings are ones. We can only go to the tenths. So this would be four point, excuse me, 3.0 centimeters. And then how about down here? Well, if these are feet, uh, smallest markings 0, 1, 2, 3, I'm counting by 1's so just like the one above I would have to go to the tenths so that looks like it's halfway in between so I'd call that 1.5 feet and this one looks like it's right on the line so since we've already agreed that we're going to the tenths so this would be 3.0 feet okay now we're going to practice taking measurements uh, with volume uh, first with devices that we would call graduated cylinders which measure from the bottom up and then burettes which if you'll notice the readings increase from uh, the top going down so that's something to definitely uh, take a note of when you're taking these measurements so these should be fairly clear so I would ask you to do the same thing as you've done before which is you first want to look at the lines and figure out what the smallest markings stand for and figure out what decimal place you need to report your answer to and then take a measurement. So please take a moment and pause the video and once you've got your answers written down for all five then you can go ahead and continue. Okay let's take a look at these guys here. So this is the 10 line and this is 20 and so what do each of these have to stand for? Well, if that's 10 and that's 20, 10, 11, 12, these are all ones. And I noticed the same thing is true for this graduated cylinder. So each of these are ones, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so for each of these, uh, if these are ones, I need to go to the tenths place. So I'm reading at the bottom of the meniscus. So it looks like it's about halfway between 12 
and 13. So I'm going to say this is 12.5. And I indicated that the units were milliliters up here. So I make sure to write down the units, 12.5 milliliters. This one looks like it's right on the line to me. So if it's right on the line, we still need to go to the same number of decimal places as we did here. We agreed that we would go to the tenths place, so we're going to go to the tenths place, 10.0 milliliters. If you think it's a tiny bit below, 9.9 .9 milliliters would be fine, or even 10.1 would be fine. But you must be going to the tenths place. Now this is a different graduated cylinder. This is very much like our 10 milliliter graduated cylinder in our drawers in the lab. So if this is 4 and this is 5, then these are fractions of that. So this is 4, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, they're tenths. Each of those lines stands for a tenth. Now if you skip that, you might get this wrong. You might say, oh, it's 5.0 or 5.000000 or something like that. So if these lines are tenths, we go one decimal place to the right, that would be hundredths. So 5.00 milliliters seems the best reading here. Now with the burettes, you have to be very careful because some people will go through the process and they'll say, well, if that's 30, then this is 30.1, 30.2, 30. Nope, that doesn't work because that's 29 you need to get getting smaller as you go up. So first let's figure out what those lines stand for. Uh, if this is tr uh, 28 and this is 29, uh, these would have to be tenths, 28.1, 28.2, etc. So if these are tenths, we're going to go to the hundredths place. Uh, you can count down, 29.1, 29.2, or you can count backwards up. So if that's 30, that's 29.9, 29.8, 29.7. So either way, we're between 29.7 and 29.8. So it has to begin with 29.7. We're certain of that. And it looks like it's about halfway. So I'm going to say here 29.75. Although certainly anything between about 29.73 and 29.78 would probably be reasonable. So on this burette, we have the same issue. This is 12, this is 13, this would be 12.1, 12.2, 12.3. These are tenths, and we're going to still go to the hundredths. So assuming this is right on the line, that would be 14.00 mLs. If it's right below the line, that would be 14.01 uh, milliliters. And just a little bit more practice here. Uh, here we have thermometers, and I'd like you to take a moment and practice with these, and pause the video, and when you're done, we'll continue. Okay, I'm assuming you've paused the video. You really need to practice this if you haven't. It's very important to practice writing these measurements down. This will be a reasonably substantial part of the first exam. Okay, so this is 70, this is 80, so each of these markings is a 1, right? 70, 71, 72. So that's 80, this is 80, uh, excuse me, this is 79, 78. So we're between 79 and 80. We're certain of the 79. Uh, looks like it's about halfway. So I'd say 79.5, maybe 79.4 uh, degrees Celsius. Those all look good to me. Ah, another one that people are likely to make a mistake on because it's right on the line. So let's make sure we don't do that. So 29, 30. The big numbers are 1s. So what are these small ones? 29, 29.1, 29.2. They're tenths. So if the smallest markings are tenths, we must go to the hundredths place. And so 30.00, that's to the hundredths place, would be a good reading. 30.00 degrees Celsius. With this one we have to be careful because it's common to measure temperatures uh, in negative temperatures here, but the rules still apply. It's just we have to count correctly like we're on a number line. So if this is 0 and this is negative 10, then what would this have to be? It wouldn't be negative 9 because that would make no sense. 0, negative 9, negative 8, negative 7, 
Now, that doesn't make any sense. If this is 0, then this is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So I'm going by 1s. That means that my answer has to go by tenths, one decimal place to the right. So this is just above negative uh, 10, or we would say technically just below negative 10. Uh, but it's much closer to negative 10 than negative 11. So I would say negative 10.1 or negative 10.2 degrees Celsius would be a good value. And I'm sorry to harp on this, and in the first uh, experiment I spent even more time on this issue, but that just shows you how critically important it is that you measure things correctly. If you're going to be a nurse, the last thing you want to be doing is giving a patient 10 times too much of a medication or 10 times too little because you didn't read the numbers correctly. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of this skill. It keeps people alive. All right, so to summarize then, in a given measurement, digits which you are certain of are called certain. Those are the digits always at the left. There's usually uh, one certain digit, but it is possible to have no certain digits. Uh, and there's always exactly one uncertain digit, and it's always the rightmost digit. If there is only one digit, it is uh, the uncertain or estimated digit, and it's always to the right. If you are looking at any kind of a piece of equipment with markings, like we did just a moment ago, you look for whatever the smallest markings or smallest intervals are, so tenths, hundredths, or whatever, and you always go exactly one decimal place to the right of that. And for electronic devices like digital balances, you don't do that because the last place is already uh, taken into account for you. The last digit is the uncertain digit. I'm going to go ahead and end here on this lecture. And when we pick up, we'll look at the next important chemistry topic of significant figures. Thank you.